My name is Mike Resendiz. Ben Bradley, Jr. Walter Robinson. Sasha Pfeiffer. But you know what? We're always humbled because the people who have the notebooks out, we really respect, so... It's we, we fear them. We fear the notebooks, yes. Well, uh, I had to ask my friend, Mike Resendez, what, what does that actually mean? Because we didn't quite get it, but we, we were kind of stunned. You know, the stories we did were obviously had great impact, but we never thought anybody would be interested in a film about how we made the sausage. Mm -hmm. So we were a little incredulous. And I think, you know, we had, I don't think any of us ever thought this was movie material or that it could make interesting movie material, but I think there's, what, what we've seen is they're so skilled as filmmakers because they took what in real life was often tedious, drudgery, slow work, and they made it engrossing. Like a spreadsheet that took three slow weeks is two riveting minutes of movie, and that shows how talented they are, I think. We had some concerns initially um, because, you know, who knows? Uh, we, we weren't sure about the quality of the d direction or the script. This was before we even had read the script, and they theoretically could have taken the movie and different directions and gone down, you know, various detours, but they did such a fantastic job. And uh, all the time that Josh and uh, Tom spent with us um, put us at ease quickly, and we knew we were in the hands of a really quality crew. I, th I think credit also has to go to the two producers who initially approached us, which is uh, Nicole Rocklin and Bly Faust. And uh, I, I met with them out in California. I happened to be out there. And I think it was their uh, sincerity and uh, the way they pitched the story to us, which was a, st a story about the importance of investigative reporting at a time when investigative reporting is really under siege at a lot of institutions, not at the Globe, but at others. So I think it was a combination of the, their pitch and their sincerity uh, and the, uh, the feeling that they were going to work very hard to make this happen. Uh, I, thought, I, th I think for those reasons, we decided to go with it. Related to that, you know, you guys know that a lot of times movies and television shows kind of are a caricature of what they think we do, what reporters and newsrooms are, and that rings hollow to us. This movie really captured what a day in the life of being a reporter is and what you can accomplish when you have the time and resources. So I think that authenticity, we feel really proud of that. Well, we're, we're all concerned um, about uh, where we are at this, at this time in, um, in journalism, with newspapers particularly. Um, obviously struggling and laying people off um, in the internet era and um, so we all love the message that the film uh, underscores which is the importance of um, uh, good investigative journalism in a democracy and the dangers of not having it. Yeah I think the the message here is it's really up to journalists to hold powerful institutions and powerful individuals accountable for what they do and really think about it, who else is going to do that except for journalists? Uh, and I think the movie makes that point uh, that uh, this is really an essential part of our society, as Ben said, in a, in a democracy, because uh, without the information that investigative journalists provide, how are people going to know the, the truth about the institutions that are governing large parts of their lives? And, you know, everybody at this table knows that print journalism is in tough shape, right? And a lot of people have said this may inspire young people to want to become reporters. That's great, but I think what I hope it really does is make people realize you have to support the print journalism industry if you want to have work like this happen. So that means if you don't want it delivered on your doorstep, we hope you get a digital subscription. I mean, that's, that's what's not happening now, that eroding revenue, and I think we have this fantasy that maybe that will be a little burst in subscriptions that helps other newspapers do what we were able to do. I, I think, uh, look, religion is, uh, in the end, very personal and faith is personal. Um, you know, people, people, uh, Catholics, uh, were, I think, rocked by uh, the revelations of this story, and it uh, caused them to question their faith and uh, perhaps stop going to church. Others um, still kept their faith. And I think in the end, that's just a very personal decision for people. And. Uh, you know, I, uh, as did my, Mike and Sasha, we, we all grew up Catholic. We were raised Catholic. I had 12 years of Catholic education at, at a time in the 50s and the 60s when uh, the Catholic Church was so interwoven into the lives of our families uh, that we took it for granted that nothing bad could ever happen if you were enveloped in the arms of the Church. 
And for us as even lapsed Catholics to find out that this institution had been responsible for enabling and covering up the rape and sexual molestation of tens of thousands of children by thousands of priests over decades, uh, it's unimaginable that this could happen. And if it, for me, it's uh, shattered my faith in that institution. I, as Ben said, I have my faith, uh, but, but not in, in an institution run by men who are so fallible that they would let this happen. You know, there will always be bureaucracies, bureaucracies and hierarchies, but it's just a matter of making sure that people are always questioning them, holding them to account, right? So whether it's government, nonprofit, corporate, religious, again, it's the reminder of there just has to be people that, is asking, that are asking rigorous questions because we saw what happens when over decades questions aren't asked. Well, you know, it happened in such a Catholic town, but in fact, in the United States, there's such a separation between church and state that, that it was much more likely to come out here as it did, even in as Catholic a town as Boston, than in Latin America, where there is such, so, such close ties between the church and the state. And, uh, and in fact, during our investigation, we met with the owner of a large uh, cable network in Mexico who tried to do a documentary on abuse there, and uh, the church threatened him, the government threatened him, all of his advertisers or many of his advertisers uh, threatened him if he went forward with it, and many of the stations in his network would not carry the documentary. Yeah, I think the movie is an argument for a very for a strong and independent press, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in many Latin American countries that's lacking. You know, there's a very important uh, moment, I think, in the movie where the Boston Globe editor, Marty Barron, goes to talk to Cardinal Law. And Cardinal Law says, uh, I think our institutions function the best when they work together. And Marty says, uh, excuse me, but I think the role of a newspaper is to stand alone. And I think it's a really important point. And I think one of the reasons the story broke in Boston, Massachusetts, is because we had an editor like Marty Barron, and uh, we valued an independent, uh, strong press. And I, I stress uh, independent. But obviously, Boston is not the only place where this happened. I mean, we just happened to get into the Archdiocese of Boston's file cabinets. And it's been proven again and again, when you get into the file cabinets of other dioceses, you often see it in other states, other countries. You know, it's, this is a system problem, not a city problem. But as the final scene in the movie shows, where they uh, show all the uh, cities uh, outside the United States that have been affected by this, I think uh, there's no question that this has had a, an enormous ripple effect. You know, back in 2002, when so many stories were coming out of Boston, because as Sasha said, we got into the file cabinets of the church, people would ask us questions that were like, well, is there something in the water in Boston that makes the priests want to abuse children? And we say, no, in your diocese, in your city, it's the same rate of abuse. It's just the church has managed to keep it uh, secret. And, and just as a reminder on the numbers, in the end, we found that close to 10% of the priests in the Boston Archdiocese had been credibly accused of sexually abusing children. We've also found that in the in the few dioceses where all the records have been released, uh, the number has also been about 10%. So it does uh, suggest a systemic problem that you would run into in any country. So we, sh we should change the movie. We said 6% in the movie. <laughs> well, that, that's right. Uh, and ultimately, you know, Richard Seip, who was uh, uh, excoriated for suggesting that 6% of priests might act out with minors was not only vindicated, but as a matter of fact, he was underestimating the number significantly. You, you know, I mean, that, <clears throat> that particular document about that story, it was actually a full story. It just was not prominently displayed in the paper about the 20 priests. I was the Metro editor at, at the time. Uh, when we found out about it, that story, at least the Herald version of it, which we found during our investigation, we didn't remember it. It was eight years earlier. But as you know, at a daily newspaper, you get hundreds of phone calls a day, you know, things go flying by you, you get, for every 10 people who say there's a conspiracy against them, you know, <clears> nine <throat> of them are on their off their meds, and one of them, re there really is a conspiracy, and, you know, it's it's really difficult to um, to, to sort that out. Uh, the, the one thing I would, I would say is, if we had 
I mean, in hindsight, we can all see with all of our stories, you know, gee, I wish I had known that or if I'd noticed this. Um, if we'd gotten it three or four years earlier, before the Internet age, it wouldn't have gone viral, uh, number one. And number two, this was going on in every archdiocese, and every archdiocese has a major newspaper, and we still got it first, the enormity of the problem. So, you know, yeah, of course, I mean, that's reporting. You know, you sort of, it's two steps forward, one step back, and... Um, but, uh, but in the end, we, we, we got it right. And to I, emphasize I, something Robbie said, I mean, it sounds so comical now in this era of digital journalism, but this was the early era of the Internet. And again, a few years earlier, it, our stories would only have been read by people in, a, in the radius of the Boston area. They were read all around the country. That meant tip calls came pouring in all around the country, and that benefited our reporting. So the, the delay, although, you know, although it's, the movie depicts the sort of our, our, our beating ourselves up for it, there was a benefit in, in the delay. The... the um the narrower story that he alluded to there about, you know, the one that fell between the cracks, that's a separate issue, and it's an example of how, um, uh, you know, journalism, uh, th things do fall between the cracks in the chaos of the day. The guy uh, faxed over a list of names, and that comes in amidst uh, two or three hundred faxes a day, and uh, so that was an example of, of something that we booted. But the... the your, your larger question of could we have gone after it earlier is a complicated one. And uh, in fact, we, this was not an unfamiliar topic to us, uh, clerical sexual abuse. In, in the early 90s, we had conducted a big investigation of another bad priest, Father James Porter. And, um, you know, the difference was that we, we couldn't get the goods on that. You know, not every story is a home run. Sometimes you hit a single, sometimes you hit a double. And um, we did good work on that story, but the, the, in, in the final analysis, we couldn't get the internal church documents that we were able to get in the Gagan case, which took that story to a different level. And um, so I think the, the movie is, raises important questions about um, deference and... Um, uh, people, uh, not just the globe, but, but others, uh, being aware of a problem, perhaps through scuttlebutt, but never really taking it head on. Extremely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I, I personally was extremely guarded at the beginning. They were asking us very personal questions, like how did this affect your marriage? And I wondered, once that gets put through the Holly machine, what's that going to look like on screen? Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that's why the end result is so lovely. It has integrity. It's, it's not salacious, it's not over, it's not glamorized, it's not exaggerated. And we saw how hard the actors work behind the scene to be as good as they are, including depicting mannerisms we didn't know we had. <laughs> you know, when you think about it, this movie is really amazing because uh, there's no explosions, there's no car chase, there's no nudity, never mind sex, and there isn't a single firearm. And yet, this is a really exciting thrilling movie that uh, very accurately portrays uh, the substance of what we did. It's almost uh, an, an act of genius, I think. You know, I, th I mean, I think The Globe, then and now, was pretty good on gender balance, you know, and, and I never, no, I didn't think I felt like having to prove. I think we felt like equals. You know, I had covered the courthouse, and I knew the legal system really well, so when Robbie was assembling the new team, he, he sort of was selecting by expertise. Mike had had a ton of political work. Matt Carroll had done a lot of database work. I had courts and legal, so it was a good complementary team. I think maybe the one thing I brought as a woman is that a lot of these victims were incredibly embarrassed and humiliated and ashamed by what had happened, and I think it was easier for them to talk to a woman about those things. So I think that might have been one gender advantage in this project. You, you know, I'd, I'd been an editor for uh, quite a while, uh, thanks to Ben Bradley uh, recruiting me as a city editor uh, a number of years earlier, and... Um, uh, I think uh, I developed a, a fine eye for talented reporters, and when I took over the Spotlight team just a year or so, not even a year before we began our investigation, I was allowed to put together this team. And, and actually, the, uh, it, it almost doesn't matter what reporting I did on this investigation. Uh, the fact that I was able to bring together such talented reporters as Sasha and Mike and Matt Carroll and that, you know, we talk about the ensemble cast and what a great job they did in this film. 
we had an ensemble cast of reporters that worked extremely well together. Uh, everybody was selfless and wanting to help everyone else. And when you have four really good reporters, and we were all good reporters, working together, it's like having almost like a fifth brain in the room, you know, where, where, where you feed off one another and you, you give one another tips and helpful suggestions. Well, why didn't you try this? Why, how about that? Uh, it makes for a m much better reporting in the long run, and that's where we ended up. Well, we never thought this was going to make a great movie. I mean, if you asked us, we would say, what? We, re what, we, we read court documents. You know, how can this, how can we, as we, we assemble databases. We look at church directories. How could this ever be cinematic? Well, yeah, but I'll tell you, now that they've turned this into something exciting, I'll tell you to think unconventionally. We did what I thought was a great project about private foundations, charitable foundations. They ostensibly exist to do philanthropic good work. We did a project about how really what it's a great way to do is put your kids on the payroll, write off fancy cars, in one case write off an airplane, you know, you know, pay tr elderly trustees who do no work a lot of money. It's really a, a real abuse of the tax code and of, of the spirit of philanthropy. We read a lot of tax documents. I would tell you, I don't think that's a good movie. Maybe Josh Singer and Todd McCarthy could turn that into a really riveting journalism story. My name is Mike Resendiz. Ben Bradley, Jr. Sasha Pfeiffer. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Walter Robinson, let me introduce Sasha right. Pfeiffer to you. <laughs> Sasha Pfeiffer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.